It's wonderful to see a few new faces amongst us as well. If you're new and joining us for the first time, it's great to have you with us as well. As we begin, why don't we ask for the Lord to bless our hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for your many, many blessings to us. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. And Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts that delight in what you're saying to us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Reformation Sunday. And it started, you may know, with an ordinary unknown monk banging his 95 theses or objections to the church door in Wittenberg. You might be forgiven for thinking, well, that was just uh, the, the beginning of it and we all lived happily ever after and that was the start of the Protestant church. But just four years later, Martin Luther would be called before the most powerful man on the planet. And he was to be interrogated by the most prestigious, educated and experienced church leaders of the day. He was to give an answer for what he was teaching and proclaiming. How did he respond? We'll get to that in just a moment. But we have in this passage a very similar position. Peter and John, in the previous chapter that we looked at last week, they just healed a man, a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. They were going up to the temple to pray. The man had reached out and asked for help, presumably financial assistance. And Peter said, I have no silver, I have no gold, but what I do have to you, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he took his hand and said, get up and walk. As the man clung to Peter and John in the temple, the crowds gathered round. And as we heard last week, Peter explained that this is not just a sign for them to enjoy, but this is a moment for them to turn back and put their faith in God's King, in the risen King, Jesus. Well, the next day, things are heating up. Of course, the religious establishment of the day are very, very interested in what's going on. What is happening in their town? The question before us, and the question we're asking in this passage, is what happens when the name of Jesus is opposed? Will its speakers go silent? Will they keep their mouths shut? Will they recant? My aim today is to reassure us that the powerful name of Jesus, though it's opposed by human leaders, advances through the bold proclamation of Jesus. Through the, sorry, through the bold proclamation of ordinary people. I'll give you that sentence again because that's how we're going to structure our time over the next few minutes. The powerful name of Jesus, though opposed, advances by the bold proclamation of ordinary people. Do keep your Bibles open to page 912 because that's where we're going to be looking for the next few moments. Point one, the powerful name of Jesus. As we've just noted, Peter and John are being hauled before this national inquiry. It's such an ironic moment, isn't it? We have these two simple fishermen from Galilee, and all the power, all the prestige of the city. We have two whole verses dedicated to outlining who's there. We have Annas and Caiaphas. In fact, all the members of this exclusive, prestigious family. This is the ruling elite. These are the ones in power. These were the ones who were meant to represent the people to God. And they're also meant to take God's word and bring it to bear to the people. And yet they'd been com caught completely off guard. By what authority, by what name 
do you do this? Exposing their ignorance, their culpable ignorance, and their opposition right from the outset. Peter, of course, gets, uh, doesn't waste any time and gets straight to the point. And there's only one explanation. There's only one person, there's only one name who can do this. Verse 10. Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the man from Nazareth, by him, this man is standing before you well. If Peter had just said something vague like, oh, we prayed and God healed him, well, that would have been good enough. This, these were the religious leaders of the day. But no, Peter is more precise. He's saying, it's Jesus of Nazareth, the one whom you've just executed because he claimed to be God. The one who you crucified. The one whom God raised from the dead. The one whom God has now taken up into heaven and has seated at his right hand. This is the one whom has raised this man. You have tried to oppose him but he rules and he reigns from God's right hand in heaven. And he is still actively at work, saving, restoring, bringing about God's perfect plan and God's perfect kingdom. Interestingly, the verse, the word for heal in verse 9 is also the word for save, indicating there's, there's something deeper. It's not just an outward miracle that's happened, but a real genuine work of salvation has happened. As Peter goes on, this man, Jesus, he is the cornerstone. He is the very focal point of all God's plans. These builders, these leaders, they were meant to be building God's house. They were meant to be preaching God's word. They were meant to be explaining to the people how God would build his house. And yet, what had they done? They'd rejected the cornerstone. And so, God had rejected them. Jesus himself had quoted this exact passage to the leaders just a few weeks earlier in the temple. When they'd rushed on him and questioned him, he said, what happens when the builders reject the cornerstone? Well, they'll be crushed on that cornerstone. The point that Jesus was making is that the leadership of the day were not doing what they were meant to do. And Jesus himself, though rejected by the leaders, was the very center, the very focal point, the cornerstone around which God would build his plans and his kingdom and his house. Well, Peter has just one, one more sentence in him before he finishes. Verse 12, he concludes, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The point that Peter is so boldly driving home is that the very name that they've been rejecting is the only hope for mankind. It is the name which they need to embrace. The name of Jesus is supreme and is the only hope for salvation. You may have heard of Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's a former Muslim, and for many years um, after 9-11 became one of Islam's most vocal critics. Uh, She's been living um, in police protection and for the last few years um, has been living with constant uh, death threats because she's dared to speak out against Islam. What's radical and crazy about, not what she said about Islam, but that in the last few weeks she's been reflecting on the importance of the Christian uh, worldview. And as she's reflected on what 
Christ has offered to the world, it's helped her to think about who is the person underneath this worldview. Now, she's not just interested in Christ because he offers a great worldview. She's actually come to realize that he actually offers a a real salvation. Let me just read a very quick sentence from an article that she published this week. Yet I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace to Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I've also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed nearly, very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Here is someone who, in her own words, is starting to grapple with, and perhaps she's genuine in her convictions, but is starting to realize that there is salvation in no other name. That the name of Jesus, for all of its benefits to the rest of society and for all of the great things that we need a worldview to be founded on, is actually powerful because it offers salvation. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Recently, I was at a conference and they shared how the church is growing in Madagascar. One of the pastors uh, there said that in the last two years, they've seen 50 churches started in an area the size of Madagascar, in an area the size of Illawarra, of the Illawarra. In one day, they apparently baptized 2,000 people. Praise God. The name of Jesus is being seen for who it is, the only name that can save. Across the world, from the educated, from the Ayan Hersey alleys, right down to the ordinary people, the name of Jesus is being embraced. The name of Jesus is being recognized as the only name by which we can be saved. So point one, the name of Jesus does save. The powerful name of Jesus. Point two, the name of Jesus will be oppressed, will be opposed. And the point that we see here is that the opposition by the, lead, by the human leaders is utter foolishness. At this point, we might be expecting the ruling elite to recognize their error and to humbly turn to the only name that can save them. A few days earlier, Peter had proclaimed boldly to the crowd that they needed to repent, that they needed to turn back and to seek forgiveness. And they did. We read in chapter 2, didn't we? Acts chapter chapter 2. And 3,000 were added to to the church that day. But instead of acknowledging the undeniable power of the Lord Jesus... And turning and repenting, what do these leaders and officials do? Verse 16, they cannot deny it. They cannot offer an alternative explanation. And so what do they do? They choose the most foolish of responses. Verse 18, they called them in and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. How foolish. These were the experts. These were the leaders. These were the ones who were given the privileged position of studying the Scriptures and teaching people the Word of God. These were the ones who, when they read Psalm 2, as was just read to us, should have recognized, I think that's Jesus. I think the one that we crucified, the one who has been raised, is still at work. And yet, what did they do? When faced with the most powerful of signs, a man who could never walk, being able to walk. What do they do when faced with the most undeniable of explanations? That this is Jesus, the one who was raised from the dead? Well, they bury their heads in the sand. They refuse to believe. They harden their hearts. And what do they do? They try to silence these men. All human opposition 
is madness. All human suppression attempts to oppose King Jesus are utterly foolish. It goes against all the evidence. I think we deep down know as human beings that if there is another king in charge, then we are not. Then we have to give an answer for the actions that we've done, for the life that we've lived, and for our words and deeds. It's no secret that we live in an age where our society and the leaders of our um, part of the world have largely rejected Jesus' name. Whether it's the banning of books in our SRE curricula, whether it's the accusation of hate speech for teaching Christian ethics, whether it's the public contempt shown by our academic institutions against the name of Jesus. We live in a society that has not changed, where the ruling elite, where the leaders, where those in power continually oppose the name of Jesus. Why? Because they've been threatened and they know that God's King will prevail. Point one, the name of Jesus is supremely powerful to save. Point two, the name of Jesus will be opposed by human leaders. And finally, point three, the name of Jesus advances by the bold proclamation of ordinary people. We see the boldness of Peter and John right throughout this section. We saw it the previous day when Peter addressed the crowd. We saw it in Peter's first response to this impressive panel. And he boldly called them out. You were the ones who crucified God's King. This was a man who, just a few weeks earlier, when approached by a slave girl, cowered and ran. And yet he was so compelled by the truth that even to the most erudite and educated and experienced leaders, he was able to get up and say, no, no, Jesus has healed this man, and Jesus is God's King. He is the cornerstone, the very focal point of what God is doing amongst us. It was their boldness that silenced them. They were utterly astonished. They had nothing to say in response. After they called them back in, they charged them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. So what does Peter do? Verse 19, boldly he proclaims, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. What is the explanation for their boldness? There's a little line at the end of verse 13. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. The same boldness that Jesus had demonstrated in his ministry was now coming out in his disciples. Well, what do they do when they go home? They go home, they tell their friends, and you would think that they would pray for the threatening and for the opposition to cease. But what do they do? They go home and they pray. They reach out to their sovereign Lord through prayer. They acknowledge God's hand and they acknowledge that everything that is taking place is according to God's plan. Verse 29, And grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What do they do? Instead of praying for the persecution to stop, they look into their Bibles and they recognize that this is all happening according to God's plans and purposes. And so they pray for more boldness. And they ask that the Lord would fill them with courage to speak. And they did. Verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they went about speaking. This wasn't just the preserve of Peter and John. No, this was the activity of the whole group. They were all engaged in speaking boldly. Well, this is what happens when people like you and I, ordinary people, are gripped by the name of Jesus. 
when we're convinced that what God is doing in this world is more important than our own comfort and our own safety. This was what happens when a church proclaims Jesus as the cornerstone. I remember a few weeks ago, I, not a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, sorry, years ago, <laughs> a few years ago, I remember chatting with a friend who was over from Egypt and uh, studying at college with me. He was doing his PhD. And he, I remember him sharing about uh, the sort of, sort of persecutions and pressure that the church in Egypt faces. Um, he shared this story. He said, um, often they have people from the West, big, powerful West, lots of money, thinking they, they can help and alleviate the persecution and the suffering, uh, come to them and, and say, what, what can we do to help? Uh, thinking, of course, that the answer was, pray for the persecution to stop. But the Church of Egypt replied, no, don't. Don't pray for the persecution to stop. Pray that we'll be bold. Pray that we'll stick with the truth, that we won't deny Christ when the hour comes. Pray that we will continue to speak of the Lord Jesus. It was very, very moving very convicting. Just yesterday I was reading uh, about the largest, one of the largest evangelical movements across the world and it's happening in Iran, a nation that for more than 40 years has tried to silence the name of Jesus. What happens when the rulers of this world, when those in power try to silence the name of Christ? Well, its followers speak more and more boldly. If you just flick over in your Bibles, I just want to point out one final verse. Chapter 6, verse 7. Just after, in a few chapters' time, we're going to come to this, but I just wanted to highlight it and point it out. Because at this, at this point, we read that the Word of God was going out. And at the end of verse 7, we read, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Wow. I wonder if a few of those priests had listened as Peter and John proclaimed Jesus as the only name that can save. And they went back and they read through Psalm 2. They went through the Psalm, Psalm 118. Jesus is the cornerstone. And they began to realize, wow, maybe the one whom we crucified is God's King, after all. What have we seen? We've seen the powerful name of Jesus, though opposed by human leaders, advances by the bold proclamation of ordinary leaders. A few thoughts as we close. Be confident. Be confident that nothing can oppose God's plan. God will honour His King. He will honour the Lord Jesus. Even though his plans are opposed and the rulers, the leaders, the educated, the powerful of this world try to oppose his king and silence his name, his king will prevail. And be amazed at what God can do through the weak and yet spirit-filled ordinary person. He uses people like you and I. We're not Peter and John, we're the ordinary ones in the end of verse 31 who are also filled with the Holy Spirit and able to speak. We began with Martin Luther being hauled before the all-powerful tribunal of the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor and asked to give an account and basically recant, for, recant his writings and his books. How did he respond? Well, he took a day to think about it. And then he came back and he said, unless I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by clear reasoning, I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that the powerful name of Jesus, though opposed by human leaders, continues to advance through the bold proclamation 
of ordinary believers. Our Father, help us, please, to be confident in what you are doing. Reassure our hearts and refresh us. And Father, fill us with your Spirit to speak words and to live lives that point to Christ. All this we pray in his name. Amen.